That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Comic Reviews. I'm a day late, and it's the early afternoon when I'm actually broadcasting. Uh, and that's just because I had a lot of books, uh, 11 things to talk about in total, um, and I just didn't get a chance to really get reading until like 6.30 that evening, so here we are. Uh, because I'm in the middle of the afternoon, even though it is a holiday, happy uh, death to the Indians day, um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started because I really don't think I'm going to have much of a live audience tonight, but hey, if anyone shows up, or today, if anyone shows up live, I'd be happy to have you. Anyway. So tonight, we got a thick boy. We'll be discussing Zorro Legendary Adventures number three, Female Furies number six, Cosmic Ghost Rider Destroys Marvel History number five, Savage, Savage Avengers number three, It Came Out on a Wednesday number seven, Black Hammer Age of Doom number 11, Black Hammer Encyclopedia Lois Lane, number one. I love that she looks like uh, Carmen Sandiego. I can't be the only one who thought of that. Uh, the Green Lantern, number nine. Adventures of the Super Sons, number 12. And for trade talk tonight, continuing the Green Lantern theme for a while here, we're going to discuss Green Lantern, the movie prequels. Uh, it's a trade. So, yeah. Should be a fun time. Uh, alright everyone, let's go ahead and get into it and start off with Zorro Legendary Adventures, book two, number three. Um, so this is an interesting story, or interesting addition to this volume because so much of this series has been these short little, little strips, or short little stories that are maybe two to five pages apiece, um, whereas this is a two-parter it was originally a two-parter that's now been collected in just one book. Um, so it's just like a, a complete story uh, in a single thing that actually takes up the, the whole length of the issue. Um, and it's it's a pretty basic Zorro story, though. I, I wish it had um, more going on for it than, than what it does, unfortunately. Um... Uh, Evil captain of the Spanish military arrests a guy for being a guerrilla fighter, uh, but really the guy's not. It's just that the captain wants to marry his sweetheart, so he devises this plan where he's like, all right, I'm going to arrest him and tell her that in order for, to save his life, she has to marry me, and then I'm just going to kill him anyway, but she won't know about that. He's going to write a letter to her saying that I let him go, and yada yada, and it's just... And Zorro comes in and, and has to foil it. That's that's really the whole thing. And it's like, eh. Um, also, the, the title is really good for something that really doesn't play as big a part as I'd hope. Uh, it's called Zorro the Black Cape. And that sounds really cool. That's like a very good Zorro title. It's just, at one point, Sergeant Garcia sees that Don Diego de la Vega has a black cloak. And he's like, oh, that looks like Zorro's cloak. And really, it, it literally doesn't amount to anything. Um, like, they, it almost, like, like gets forgotten about. Um, literally, the last two panels, um, it's incredible that the events that have transpired ever since I've been immobilized in this chair... You know, Don Diego, for a moment I considered that it might be you who are Zorro. Me, Zorro. Ha 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 ha. I know how stupid of me, and all because you. I saw a piece of black material fall from your carriage. The cape of Zorro, I must have been crazy. Ha 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 It's just. That's nothing. I, 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 that's. That's not enough to really base any drama in the story around. Um, still waiting for the day that. Uh, that we get a story where Garcia figures it all out, but I don't know. Ultimately, it's one of those things where I'm I'm having more fun reading it than I am talking about it. So I'm just going to go ahead and move on since I don't think anyone else actually cares about Zorro. Uh, anyway, 
Let's go ahead and go on to Female Furies number six. Uh, so this is the conclusion of the Female Furies six issue miniseries. And I gotta say, I really, really loved this series when it started, and I think this series has a lot of interesting things to say. And it actually does end in a, from some perspectives, satisfying manner. Uh, and I'll, I'll break down what I mean by that in a second. Ultimately, when I read this, I was like, okay, this is really good. This is just not Apocalypse. This is not Dark Side. These are not the Female Furies. This is not Grand Goodness. In the way that I, and I feel that most fans, have, have come to see the way Apocalypse functions. Um... Again, for me, it's it's really hard to, to dissociate this one particular scene from Apocalypse, because I think it's just, that's, that is Apocalypse to me. It's in Superman the Animated Series, the conclusion of it all, where Superman's fighting Darkseid, and he doesn't have the heart to kill him, but he does the next best thing in his mind, which is... He's defeated Darkseid, and he hands him over, bloodied and beaten, to the people Darkseid has been ruling over as a tyrant. And Superman very clearly has a hope in what will happen in, in so doing that. And the tragedy is that the people don't tear Darkseid to pieces. They don't kill him. They, in fact, help him up. And they take him back into his fortress, his castle, to recover. And Darkseid stops him real quick and he says, I am many things, Kal-El, but here I am God. And that is something that's always stuck with me. That, that Dark, what, what makes Darkseid scary is, is not that he's a tyrant, is that he is a complete tyrant of unmeasured success that that the people truly do not understand what freedom is and so i was able to acknowledge that that's pretty much the take that i feel a lot of people have that that you know they dance around it there's variations but that's the general take and that this female furies was kind of ignoring that in in order to tell a story that it wanted to tell, uh, focused around a lot of the ideas and, and the discussion that's been going on uh, since the start of the Me Too movement. And I actually very much do support that. I thought that was a very fair thing to do. I thought it was handled really, really well. And I think that all six issues are really, really good about delivering that. My problem with this issue is it does end up with, you know, frankly, a happy ending, all things considered, in a way that I feel does a disservice to Barda and the female Furies. Um, so Barda and the Furies began kind of a revolution on Apocalypse, um, and a female revolution. They're... they're encouraging the women to protest and at first they they receive a lot of backlash from it uh so that that was kind of like feeding into okay these people are just that brainwashed um but ultimately by the end of the issue the revolution succeeds they are able to uh you know sway the women of apocalypse to their side including the new group of female fairies that granny has tried to create to replace them um they're, they're able to kind of save, save the women of Apocalypse and, and create a new, um, a new Apocalypse where they now rule together and Bart is off with Scott on Earth. And I don't know, there's something about that. There's something... Happy endings are, are all well and good, but there is something to the tragedy of Apocalypse. There is something to the tragedy of Barda and Scott being the only ones to escape and everyone else being that brainwashed. That I do feel gets a little lost. So ultimately, when I look at this just as a story on its own, removed from my personal views of 
of Apocalypse and stuff, I think it's fine. I think it's, it's actually, I think it's more than fine. I think it's doing a very good job at delivering a very important message. When I read it as a DC fan, as a fan of Apocalypse, I do feel that it's important, but it's losing something by, by not embracing kind of the horror of Apocalypse more. So that's kind of where I end up on this one. Um, overall, it was a really good series, though. Um, really good art. I'm going to plan to maybe reread this, uh, all six issues, back to back, see if it, um, if it maybe works a little bit better for me or not. But ultimately, uh, it, was, it was really cool to see this. More New God stuff, please. I'd, I'd love more. Um, Alrighty. Tom King, 12 issue Orion series, go. <laughs> Alrighty. Let's see here. What's going on in the live comments? Ra Red Ranger Rob, hey Rob, says, Oh, well, trade today is Green Lantern, the movie prequels, and I literally just bought it today after finding it in a bargain bin. Same! I got it for $3, which is less than I would have spent on any single issue, so I was quite pleased about that. Uh, Manos says, hey there, hey there, Manos. Um, Rob says, I did like the low wise calling out Barda preaching about inequality from her place of relative pri privilege as a cri criticism of white feminism. But it was undercut by being delivered from non-women of color. Fair. I think that's fair. Um, Shadow Batman says hi. Hi, Shadow Batman. All right. Let's go ahead and go on and talk about Cosmic Ghost Rider Destroys Marvel History number five. Man, oh man. Okay, so I'm just going to cut straight to the chase. Um... It took a couple weeks, uh, well, I guess a couple months. It took a couple months, but finally someone just did it. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to take out the Hulk, Ant-Man, why don't you just fly up his you-know-what and then grow? What? No, I can't. That's crazy. Really? Because I thought you were about stopping serious threats. What am I doing? I'm a biochemist! It took, it took so little time. Oh man, that's just funny. I don't think, I, you know, I, I honestly think Ant-Man is, is not going to be known anymore as the guy that beat his wife. I think it, the, the, the post-Endgame world is just going to be Ant-Man's the guy who could just kill anybody by going up their butt. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, what is it? Kyle Hill, the, the Because Science guy, ended up doing a whole video about whether or not that would work. Um, and it's it's pretty hilarious that we're just at that point. So, yeah, I think, I think the internet has saved Ant-Man from being a wife beater, and now he's just a... a anal grower um so that's funny okay anyway in this issue frank is is with his family posing as as the crazy wacky uncle who's also a superhero and this is the day where they go to the park that frank castle's family dies um and we've just got Basically, a whole bunch of stories up before that about how he fought Hulk and kind of sort of accidentally created the Avengers by, you know, pulling Captain America out of the ice. And then he's like, um, uh, shout out Batman's wondering if it's Hank Pym or Scott Lang, it's Hank Pym. Uh, he accidentally creates the Avengers, and then he's like trying to tell a story about a mission he went on with Black Widow and Mockingbird. Uh, get a little quick change reference because they're pretending to be bank robbers. Um, he goes on this mission and they walk in the building and just shoots a guy in the head and everyone's like, whoa! And he's like, oh, right, right. Family friendly. And so he changes all the details of the stories to how they're just trying to give people candy. And that's pretty funny. I think, I think Black Widow shooting people to death with Pez dispensers is probably my favorite image from that book. Um, that was pretty good, too. Anyway, uh, so, but by the time he gets to the end of the story, he's tried to clean it up so much from all its, like, blood and gore 
that it's just incomprehensible. And he's like, okay, so I can't do family friendly. And then he sees the gang that's going to end up killing his family, and so he goes to kill them, at which point Watu shows up and says, no, don't you see? Because of everything you've done under Galactus and Thanos, you are now one of the most important people in the universe, and because you've decided to go back in time and intermingle yourself so heavily in the Age of Marvels, you are now tied to the development and the entire history of time and space. So if you kill this man and stop Frank Castle from becoming, um, you know, the Punisher, then all of reality will cease to exist. And I kind of like that it's way too cosmic and big for the Punisher, and that's what kind of makes it funny. Um... And then so Watu decides to pull a gun on Frank, um, but he doesn't have the heart to do it. And then we just see, you know, kind of a close-up of his hand and the gun. Then we get a page turn. Blam, Frank. So we don't know quite what happened. My suspicion is going to be that Watu is the one that kills the Punisher's family. That's my guess. <laughs> um, anyway... I'm I'm still really enjoying this series. The the crazy kookiness of it all is just super fun. Uh, that's something I think Marvel does really well. Uh, just crazy over the top kookiness like this is is pretty good because obviously we got we got uh, Cosmic Ghost Rider, we got Dare, uh, Deadpool, yada yada. Uh, let's see here. Shadow Batman says, to be honest, if Ant Man go did go up Thanos's butt and expanded, Thanos would have said should have aimed for the head. I mean, yeah, that's the thing. It's like, you can go anywhere in Thanos' body and grow, but it's just the butt is the funniest, you know? The butt is a, is a naturally funny part of the body. It makes noises. It stinks. Just saying. <laughs> More Marvel than I usually have this week uh, as we go on to Savage Avengers number three. And I gotta say, this series, what I always worry about with the Marvel book is I kind of get into it for a little bit, and then it just starts dragging, and it bores the crap out of me. And that usually happens around issue four to five. Um, so far we're at issue three, and there's been nothing but rising action. Looks like this story might be over by issue four, or possibly issue five, so we'll see. And just, man, this was a great issue. Uh, I had so much fun reading this. It's so ridiculous. Ridiculously over the top. So Frank Castle meets up with Elektra as they both try to infiltrate the hand, and then they go forward, try to, you know, stop the the bad guy plot to summon an evil god. Um, meanwhile, bad guy has captured Wolverine and is suspending him over this mystical bowl of blood used to summon the evil god, and he just keeps, like, stabbing and cutting Wolverine up to drain his blood into the bowl and that's pretty fucking gnarly as shit um meanwhile conan couldn't help himself he had to come back and and try to help wolverine uh same with brother voodoo who attempts to stab the bad guy in the heart unfortunately it doesn't quite work because his magics are stronger um and then frank and electra show up and they start to um, get them get involved in everything, uh, but finally it's it's Conan that shows up, and we just get one of the best lines of dialogue ever. It's yeah, I think this single line of dialogue may have made me a fan of Conan the Barbarian. Um, Let me buy these people from you. That is a bargain for this amulet of power. Take it, or I shall run you through. Did he just... Voodoo already tried stabbing the wizard in the heart. He has not been stabbed in the heart. By me. Oh, God, that is such a good fucking line of dialogue. <laughs> oh, man, I... It's so dumb, but I love it so much. That is just perfect. He already... We already stabbed him in the heart. He has not been stabbed in the heart. By me. <laughs> Um, 
And so then it gets it gets pretty chaotic. Uh, Electra saves Wolverine and uh, gets him over to Conan, and then and then it just it, it gets all craziness from there. My favorite is. Um, Deny me, and we will find exquisite pleasure in delaying death. Ask your friend there if he wants to hang above the bowl again. I could slay you on my own, but together with this dwarven champion I shall... Thunk. Wolverine just, like, extends his claws ready to fight, and he just falls over due to blood loss. Um, recover my amulet. On your feet, man! Fight for paps! Back knaves, and so like Conan the Barbarian just starts swinging Wolverine around, unconscious Wolverine. Ah, live, man! You must tell me where you got these blades. And it's just ah, oh, it's so good. It's so good. Um, then Wolverine gets knocked out of his hands, and the the evil wizard um just bursts through Conan's chest, and it looks like Conan the Barbarian's about to die. But then. The Venom Symbiote's there, and the Venom Symbiote fills the hole in Conan's chest and creates a, a sword from itself. And so you got Conan the Barbarian with a sword made from a symbiote, and I'm kind of here for it. Um, Kill them all. Krom, I hear you and I obey! It's so good. Oh, man. But it doesn't look like it's all gonna work out. The the fight the fact that Conan's there just killing the shit out of hand ninjas is enough to to allow the wizard to summon the evil gods. So that'll be the next issue. And again, I just I was super enjoying this. The dialogue is just exquisite dialogue. Um super fun. Very enjoyable book so far. Can't wait wait to read more. Excuse me for one moment, please. Alright, that should be better. Oh yeah, that looks much better. Why didn't I think of that earlier? Okay. So yeah, very good book. I'm, I'm excited for more of that. Okay, let's go ahead and go on. It came out on a Wednesday, number seven. Um, I feel like I read this book every time and I'm a little disappointed, but I keep reading it because it's only $2. Uh, first story we get is uh, Log, Enchanter of the Trees, where we figure out that Log, this weird giant that's part tree or whatever, um, can repair other trees. Uh, an evil sorceress sees this and demands that Log fix this cursed forest uh he refuses and so she kills his bird friend and tries to take his power but then an ancient wizard uh stops her from doing that and melts her magical staff and then he talks to log and it looks like they're going to be fast friends and he also brings his bird friend back to life um eh. i i literally have nothing to say about it um the Secret Origin of Agent 87 is the next story. Uh, some bad guys are trying to kill a village of people. A little girl escapes and is saved by the Purple Viper, who's a jungle superhero, and he stops the bad guys and trains her, and then she goes and becomes Agent 87. It's a two-page story, and it's just, go buy my comic, and I'm like, no! I, I'm sorry, but that's not enough to get me to buy your comic. It's... If you want someone... If, if you want to get me into your your world uh, through a preview like that, that's not going to be enough to do it. You know, that that's mildly intriguing, but it, do, it doesn't show me that you've got a good sense of storytelling. It shows me that you know how to write a character's origin in two pages. Um, which is admirable enough, but it's just that's not that's not enough to really grab me and make me go seek out your book. Uh, assuming it is a book, um, honestly, it doesn't have anything in here telling me to go read it. So maybe this is just a two-page origin story for a character. I don't know. Uh, the next story is a bit better. 
And this is called Gibson and Hatch in Memory Lapse. And these two kind of secret agent looking guys wake up in a strange lab with no real memory of uh, what it is that got them there or even what they were doing that day. And they slowly piece it all together and retrace their steps and it's like, okay, yeah, so we came in here and I shut the door and then we were wondering about something. Oh, yeah, we were wondering why the automatic security system kept going off. That's right! And then it's like, automatic security system, re-engaging, chloroform gas, filling the room in three, two, one. And we're like, ah, shit. And so then they get gassed and, and pass out all over again. Um, and so that was fun. I enjoyed that. Again, I, I don't think it's, it's really to the book. Um, Gibson and Hatch, though, that's something that I might actually consider. I probably wouldn't go out and, you know, order it from my shop or anything, but if my shop had it and I'd read this little story, that's something where I might might give it an issue or something like that. That's a better story for, for doing that. But just ultimately, with the title like it came out on a Wednesday, with the monster cover and stuff like that, you really should be aiming more for uh, horror or, or at least horror-inspired kind of stories. And that just doesn't feel like one. But then we do get a great story. Uh, and these are kind of the gems that I keep book picking this book up for because when it does it well, like, it's it's just perfect. This is called Surgeon Song, and it's exactly the tone that I feel like I, I expect from this book. Um, it's about this guy who's a singer, and he's very, very successful, kind of getting all of these awards and stuff. But then he gets sick, and it looks like it's going to be completely inoperable. And uh, the best advice the doctors can give him is get his affairs in order. When suddenly a mysterious stranger offers him a mystical cure, uh, but it will come at uh, this, having to be the servant of her master. And so he's like, all right, make it happen. And he has a brief moment of clarity during the, the process of it happening. Um, I like the little demon girl. That's it's cool. It's nice and basic, but it's good. Um, and then he wakes up from the surgery and is told, uh, the operation was a success. Your heart beats like a 20-year-old. However, the price you paid for this is high. Your singing brought joy to so many. Now all those that listen to you will fall under my master's control. No. Everyday speech will be no different for you, but when you sing, your voice will be a lighthouse in the spiritual dark, welcoming to the souls of Satan's surgeon. Um, I like that. That's that's pretty good. Um, and then we see Satan there, and he says, Satanica, you have some bedside manner. Um, I quite like that. That was... That was just good. That's that's nice and and to the point. It's got the oh no kind of ending. It's got the this is too good to be true. Very Twilight Zone esque. Very original tales from the crypt. I just I really liked it for that reason. Um, and it was just yeah, it's just good. It's just effective. Nice, short, to the point, simple. Uh, interview with the um, cover artist who's actually the the publisher of uh, what is it Atlantean. Alteran comics. Um, so that was cool. Uh, get the Mr. Bones or Mr. Crypt story, and these ugh, these are so not good. I just I don't even have anything to say. They're just not even funny. Um, story called the Long Path that it was kind of interesting. It's, it's mostly art, which is nice. Uh, very little dialogue, um, but. I don't really have much to say about it. There's not really enough that happens. You get kind of like a Ronin feel from it, I guess, is the best I can say. A guy, a tiger man, was walking through the woods, stops at a uh, spring or a pond to drink some water when a serpent guardian uh, attacks him because it looks like he's going to try to uh, enter some mystical temple or what have you. Uh, but the guy says, no, I'm just here to get some water, and then I'm leaving. Um, and the serpent doesn't quite believe him, but walks away anyway. Um, eh, it's fine. It's, it's just fine. Uh, next we have is Void Walker. This is the final story, and it, it does fit a little bit better. Though it is an advertisement. 
Um, so we've got this guy who was kind of adopted into the mob, and yet he goes in in this story and completely betrays everyone, killing uh, all his former former mob buddies, um, and trying to get a suitcase. And it's a pretty brutal ass story, which is kind of cool. I, I like the art. I like the you know blood everywhere kind of stuff. That can be fun. Great moment where a guy gets his arm shot off. And then he's sitting there in the ground, and he sees the arm, and he's like, Is that mine? Uh, he's like, Yeah, this is too. And it's a, the bullet for him. I like that. Uh, then he, he goes and he steals the thing he was supposed to steal, leaving one person alive who ends up shooting him in the back. Um, and then he kind of gets his body thrown into a river, and that's where Void Walker is starting. I'm like, Oh, well, maybe. I might check it out. As is, I kind of just like the story. I don't really need much more. Um, so, I don't know. It was appreciated. It was fun. I don't really have much to say about this book, unfortunately. Um, but at the same time, it's $2. What can you do? It's $2. Might as well just keep reading it. Whew. Let's go ahead and go on to Black Hammer Age of Doom, number thir or number 11. Man, oh man, what a series this has been. Um, we ended last issue with Lucy being in front of her father, uh, essentially on Asgard, slash the fourth world, slash whatever they want to call it. Um, and they have this, this very touching reunion, but he says that his body was destroyed when he tried to leave the farm, but not his mind. His soul came back to New World. That's what they call it. Um, and so he could never leave, but that's what lets her be the new Black Hammer. And he was able to watch her grow up and see everything, and then it's all like, oh, anti-God's coming back, and we've got to stop the heroes from um, allowing him to return because anti-god exists in order for the universe to keep itself in balance. So if the heroes are back, then anti-god will return, and anti-god can destroy all of them. And so Lucy has to go and um, you know talk to them, and and they're all ready to kind of like fight and die like heroes, or at least Abraham Slam is. Um, she has to convince them. No, we've got to do something else. Um, and they, for that, they need Lady Dragonfly, who, you know, she's like kind of this tortured soul, like confined to a cabin, and here she's this happy mother, um, raising, you know, a family with, with its difficulties, but really she's she's just clearly in a, a better place um, than, than being stuck in a cabin forever. Uh, but then she, you know, drops her kids off and comes home, and you get the page turn, and the the super team is in there with Golden Gale stand, sitting right up front. She says, hey, bitch, nice house, because she has a fucking problem with Lady Dragonfly. Um, and that's, I don't know, it's interesting. Uh, it says, to be concluded, so I guess the next issue is the last one, uh, at least for a while. What the Black Hammer team is going to go off and do is beyond me. I guess it's maybe going to tie into this Justice League crossover, which I am ultimately perplexed by. <laughs> but again, still let really have been enjoying this series. Um, really, really interesting stuff, so I'm going to continue to read it. The next thing I have, I really should not have bought. Uh, I don't know, maybe it'll come in handy. This is The World of Black Hammer Encyclopedia. Um, and I, I bought it because these things usually have like a cool short story or something in it that's like set in that world. This didn't. Um, it's it, this was just very unfortunate. Uh, it's it's literally an encyclopedia. It's like okay, here's the timeline. And then after that, here are character profiles with different artists, um, and that's kind of cool. And it's kind of neat to see. Uh, let's see here. Do I recognize any of these names? 
Dave Rubin. No, not really. Uh, Matt Kent. No. Dave Rubin's doing like 90% of the art here anyway, so this is kind of pointless. Yeah, it's it's literally just an encyclopedia. Just this is this character, this is this character, this is this character. So this could maybe help somebody out, but I really wish I had just like taken a minute, sat and flipped through it to check to see if there are actually gonna be any stories in it or anything. I just it's my fault for assuming. I really shouldn't have just assumed that. I'm still disappointed. Um that's that's really all I got. I am I am just disappointed by it. In any case, um, what can you do? I don't know. Maybe I'll give it away to someone. Maybe it'll come in handy. Who knows? But yeah, I really don't have anything else to say about it. It's literally an encyclopedia. I I could look up these all this information on online, but whatever. Uh, next was kind of the big book of this week. I see a lot of people reading. Um, Lois Lane, number one. This is part of a new 12-issue series. This is written by Greg Rucka with art by Perkins. Perkins Matthew Perkins comes to mind? Mike Perkins. Close. Um, so this was very interesting. This is a, a incredibly topical book, um, and this is... You don't need to read the rest, the the next eleven issues, um, which should probably be an insult. But I was sorry, I just noticed something about the microphone. I was actually very happy with um, the fact that the the next eleven issues are pretty much just just needless. Um, at, at least, let me rephrase that: they're not required. Uh, th this single issue tells a complete story, sets up a status quo that's pretty much like what we've already got, teases some stuff that maybe could be revealed, but ultimately it just works as a single standalone story in one issue. What the next 11 are going to be about, I could give you some guesses, um, but again, I was just really impressed that this is just a really damn good comic that doesn't need a single page more than it has. You don't need 12 issues to tell the rest of the story. You, you just, this is it. And I'm sure that the, um, that the rest of the series is going to tie back to stuff being set up here, that there are going to be consequences for what she did here, and, and it's going to unfold. But if you had told me this is just a Lois Lane one-shot, I'd have been... 100% there for it, and this it would have worked perfectly as that. Um, so it does actually make me really, really interested what the next 11 issues are going to be. Like, if there might be a through line, but if they're all going to be in this format. Of this is Lois Lane in her status quo doing a story, and the ramifications of that be damned in which case i'm kind of there for it uh i could i could get into this series if that's all it is is just lois lane does this story and it pisses off this guy and then she just has to kind of deal with that but she doesn't care because it's the, the important things in the story um it has got just some fantastic opening pages uh, just, wow, these are great. Uh, it sets the mood for the whole book of Lois Lane just in her, or, or in her hotel room, ticking, tapping away at her keyboard, listening to the news as it plays on TV in the background. Hotel maid is cleaning up everything around her and asking if the mini bar needs to be restocked. Lois is like, Finishes what she is typing, and then says, um, boom, take that, you right, self-righteous, arrogant motherfucker. Uh, and then she finally diverts her attention back to the maid. Always and forever. I'm sorry? The mini bar Restocked. Always and forever. You've been serving this room for months. We've got a good thing going. 
Just make the bed, change the towels, restock the minibar. And don't worry about the mess, but it's my job to worry about the mess, Lois. I ask anyway. Especially if perhaps you're having company later. Um, referencing the fact that in the Bendis book, someone snapped a picture of Superman and Lois Lane making out. And that's causing some, uh, some stir. <laughs> so anyway, uh, she sent off some kind of big deal story to Perry White. And Perry in, has immediately called her and is going over it as he edits, giving her, you know, all kinds of gruff about the fact that even though she's a writer, she can't spell for shit. Lois Lane is my hero. Um, and uh, she's she's just, you know, sitting there talking about everything that's happened. Then he lets her know about a journalist friend um, who is uh, a Russian journalist who looks like she... Um, she killed herself, but she's a Russian journalist. She obviously didn't kill herself. Um, and so Lois is on to another story. Um, and she she meets a contact, who we're not sure who it is, in a, in a parking garage, and says... <clears throat> I need you to stop working on the other thing. I need you to go to Moscow. A reporter named Mariska Verona was found dead today. They're saying it was suicide. It wasn't. She saw it coming. She kept backups of her notes hidden in case something like this happened. She told me where to find them. Now I'm telling you, bring them to me. Um, and that's, you know, Lois kind of doing the, the down and dirty work. Um, and she goes back home and sleeps with Clark. Um... <laughs> Which is nice, nice part of their relationship. They wake up and together in bed and uh, just are on their way to work the next morning. Uh, but the fact that people now know Lois Lane made out with Superman has got them saying shit behind her back that only Clark can hear. And he's more bothered about it than she is, which is a very Lois Lane aspect I quite like. And they, she's like, listen... We knew what our relationship was going to be, but ultimately, you know, we decided we're going to live in some form of secret as technology kept developing. Someone was going to get a picture of something like this eventually. So now we just have to deal with it. Anyway, I love you. Bye. Um, and then we cut to Russia where the cronies of the uh, Kremlin are looking around for the... Um, the reporter's information saying um she said it was here she gave us the gps she would have said anything at that point so you think she was lying no my friend she'd have told the truth hoping that if she did it would save her life um and then they all get the shit kicked out of them by the question renee montoya i believe um <laughs> And she says, as she's leaving them all unconscious, and for the record, Miss Veronica was telling the truth. And she holds up the information she just acquired from the Kremlin. Um, and then we cut to the White House press briefing. And I'm just going to read this scene because I thought it was fucking brilliant. Um... Yes, I'm wondering if there's been any reaction to the piece that was run in the Daily Planet this morning. Haven't read it, haven't seen it. It's the Lois Lane piece. It ran this morning about the refugee camps. Can't comment if I haven't read it. Colby, come on. Can we talk about the numbers that were released today? Does anyone have a question about that? I do, actually, Leanne. I actually do have questions about the numbers. About the numbers, Lois? Specifically about the ones reported this morning, yes. All right. <clears throat> $9.4 million from Merrick Monroe, 10.7 from Wexcorp, another 8.5 from Agar and Shaw. Wait, what? All paid to individual members of the administration in exchange for it. That's enough. That's not the granting of specific contracts, including an additional 22 million earmarked for quote unquote tender care camps. Where are you getting this? Where are you getting these, these figures? I'm not at liberty to divulge my sources. You're making it up. That's all this is. Do you deny that the administration is monetizing the separation of children from their families? I'm not going to dignify... Let's take another. Is that a denial, Mr. McCarthy? Gloria, do you... 
We're talking about children as young as 18 months. I think you need to answer the question. Answer the question, Leanne. Answer the question. A remarkable exchange today between Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Lois Lane and White House spokesperson Leanne McCarthy. When the press secretary refused to answer allegations published in the Daily Planet this morning despite, desperate re despite repeated requests to do so, culminating in Lane's ejection from the briefing and the revoking of her credentials, upon resumption of the briefing, McCarthy again faced questioning. This time by other members of the press corps who continued Lane's line of inquiry, resulting in McCarthy's calling a premature end to the briefing. At this time, the administration has offered no further comment on the exchange. More on the story as it develops. DC Comics proudly presents Lois Lane, Enemy of the People. Whoo! That is a absolutely fan breaking tastic first issue and way down the book it's obviously heavily steeped in political commentary of the day happy independence day by the way everyone yay um but just even more than that it's so damn refreshing to see the type of power that lois lane has in comparison to other heroes in the dc universe she this this really does Established Lois Lane as not the the you know part of me part of me wishes this series was still called Superman's Girlfriend Lois Lane just because that's a really fun Silver Age title and it it's it's got a certain feel to it but this really is a Lois Lane book this is showing that Lois Lane does a type of heroine in the DC universe that no one else does you know Batman probably would have had his thing but. To, to expose the truth in such a, a profound and, and impactful way like that, it's just a really, really, really solid moment. Um, yeah, I was very, very impressed with that. And, and so, where does the series go from here? Well, obviously the stuff with the Kremlin is probably going to come into it. The stuff that, uh, you know, she and Clark had this conversation about how she is hiding something from him, and she says she'll tell him when it becomes necessary, but for right now, she does need to keep it to herself. And and so I'm certain that like those things are going to come up as, as the series continues for the next 11 issues, but honestly, what, what really just impresses me so much, and you know, Greg Ruck is an old pro, so of course he's capable of this, is just how damn well that first issue works. Um, that was that was very very good uh good job good great first issue all righty let's go ahead and go on talk about the green lantern number nine on a savage world of swords and sorcery as hal jordan met his match this was a weird one um so grant morrison his last major project with D with dc before the green lantern was multiversity and that was one that left a lot of people scratching their heads i did a trade talk on it it's my only scripted episode of trade talk because i wanted to try to be very very clear uh so you can go check that out if you want just search sid part 2 multiversity i'm sure you'll find it um so this is is a really interesting um kind of follow-up to that to to some of the stuff that grant morrison set up in multiversity um we open and just, God, Liam Sharp just murders billions right away. Um, what a great first page. I was so impressed with that. Um, and then we see some generic super people talking about how they can't fight this threat, how this threat that they're fighting has killed super people already, some of the most powerful members of their super team. And, and how they're not sure what to do, and the only way to really save anything is to, to escape from the monster and go and warn the others. Um, and that's, you know, that's pretty well in line with everything that was going on in Multiversity, so that was kind of cool. Uh, so one of, the, one of the heroes that we opened up with manages to escape and go to... Uh, the, the Council of Heroes, um, headquarters of the United Planet Superwatch, that's what it is, um, and warn them of the coming threat and how they need to get 
all the Green Lanterns and everyone else together. Then we cut to um, a planet in Sector 2814 of the main DC Universe, where we've got Hal Jordan all emerald knighted out with some uh, other mystical looking companions and they're fighting all these green monsters as they they work their way through this just epic battle um and it gets it gets pretty cool as you just go through it and and continue to you know they, they climb the the mystical mountain and the light forms into a giant green dragon that starts attacking them um but how you know, man just jump on the dragon's back and ride it up, and he's communicating with the ring, which has problems working on this planet for some reason, uh, as he goes to fight the evil wizard causing all this. Haban Sir. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Hal has to use the last bits of his ring energy left to fight Aban Sir, who's a mystical demon and nothing else. Um, and that the the fighting is quickly draining any ring energy he has left. Uh, but during the battle, he realizes Abaddon Sir, Abin Sir, it's Abin Sir, and he manages to um, deduce that the Abin Sir he knows would never fight and and betray a people in this way. Um, so it must be this mystical amulet. So he's able to cut it off of Abenser, and that brings his memories back. And we realize this is the same Abenser, not from Hal's origin, but from Multiversity. Um, and he has come because he is gathering Green Lanterns from all over the multiverse to help fight a terrible threat. And... As they they begin to you know look into that threat and, and try to go forward with it, um, things quickly spiral out of control. But Hal and Abba and Sir are rescued when a green portal opens up, and we've got Hippie Green Lantern, Flashlight Green Lantern, and Batman Green Lantern who have traveled from other universes to try to save. Hal and Abenser. Hurry up, we don't have much time. We're we're here to get you out. Far, far out. Uh, oh, oh, that's good. Uh, next quest for the Cosmic Grail. So we've got we've got Green Lanterns from multiple universes teaming up to fight the I'm assuming it's gonna be the same threat from multiversity, so that's really, really cool actually. Um I'm I'm hype. Uh, it's it's just continues to be awesome. Is all it comes down to. It continues to be awesome, and I'm excited. Alrighty. Oh, don't have any of that. Let's go ahead and go on and talk about Adventures of the Super Sons, number twelve. got to play this violin piece real quick. Um, I am sad. I, I was really holding out hope for a while that something that was going to happen in this was going to kind of contradict Bendis so directly that we'd, we'd have to um, we'd have to get young John back and it's possible but it's it's seeming kind of unlikely. Uh, I'm thinking this just going to be one of those things that we just let it be out of continuity, uh, even though it doesn't really have a place. Um, so Damien and John are stuck in kind of this white void inside this, this special cube. Um, and as they try to escape, the cube admits that it's been a sentient object all along, and it in fact created Rex Luthor and Joker Jr. because it saw what the universe was like and it wanted to try to live out adventures. But the creations once made took on a life of their own and quickly spiraled out of control. Um, and so they, uh, 
they sit there and they talk and they they come up with a plan which includes bringing back Puppet Master who died earlier in the series. Um, and John asks, Robin, get his stuff. Hello, Puppeteer. You were dead, but you we saved you, so you're welcome. <laughs> Can you connect this interface into the external world using the cube's energy? Damien. You want me to take an antiquated mind controlling tech and somehow daisy chain its logistical engine through some mind source connected to the very foundation of reality? Yeah. Give me two minutes. <sighs> That's the character in action I love. So they're able to, um, to take over Rex Luthor's mind. Uh, get a funny little clip here. Back to reality. Oop, there goes gravity. Um, they're able to take over Rex Luthor's mind, eject themselves from the cube, and fight together uh, against Rex Luthor to try to save all of reality. Um, and of course, an issue of a book I love just gets unfortunately damaged at the printing process. Damn it. Um, Damien ends up coming up with the plan. He grabs the, uh, the special cube and tells John to put his hand on it and think of all the adventure, all the fun they've had together. And this inspires the sentience within the cube to become just like them, trapping Rex Luthor and every chaotic thing that he created in, within himself. And so now he is able to, uh, have his own reality where he's learned everything he needs to know from the Super Sons. Um, and then, so Damien and John put the cube back in the Fortress of Solitude. They head back home and sneak into Wayne Manor, not knowing how much time has passed, but ready to go to sleep. Before they're even able to get to sleep, Alfred wakes them and says, Good! I knew you'd be back in time for the first day of school. And they are just super disappointed. <laughs> Because their whole summer is over. <laughs> Cut to an epilogue far in the future where the, the children that have been hearing this, this story of the adventures of the Super Sons just can't believe that's the end. That's so anticlimactic. They want another one. They want a better one. And so they get to read another one saying, this one's a doozy. And we end on a single page of the boys with the line at the end says, never at the end. Oh. That is a very bittersweet ending, because I, I do absolutely love it. But, man. I just... Again, the, the plot of this has been kind of all over the place. The thing that I like is, is the character interaction. Um, the, the characters here are just written so damn perfectly. Um, they're, they're super enjoyable. I mean, even the cover. That wasn't so hard, was it? After everything they've been through in this series, oh, that's such a perfect little attitude. And just everything about the boys here has been so good. And I don't think, I don't think we're going to completely undo the Bendis teenaging up John Kent thing. I don't think that's going to happen, and I'm just, I'm heartbroken over it, honestly. We might get more Super Sun stories, but it's going to be with an older John, and it's going to lose some of its charm because of that. I don't know. We'll see. It was a great ride while it lasted. I got... Two two and a half years, I guess, of, of Super Sun stories. I can't I can't complain that much. Um, it was a really really special issue, though. A really really special series. Uh, this this just hit me in a place. This just did something that I think worked really really well. And nothing against Bendis. I don't think he's a bad writer. I just don't see the justification for the the aging John Kenop thing. I don't think the story justifies its choices, at least so far. Maybe he'll blow me away, or hey, maybe, who knows, this will all go back to the way I hope it would be. And I understand that can be a bit of a selfish comic book fanboy kind of attitude, but I don't know. That's just where I'm at. Okay. 
So that does it for all the single issues this week. Uh, but I've got a trade to cover, so this should be fun. Alrighty. Green Lantern the movie prequels. I decided I'm going to stick with Green Lantern trades for a hot minute, so just strap in. I just I had a couple that I needed to get through. Um, Green Lantern the movie prequels. So this is something, I remember when the movie came out, and I was actually really excited for the movie, and I, I will still defend it to a certain extent. Uh, it's, it's far from... Um, from perfect, but man, if I doesn't have stuff that I really like in it, and I'll I'll defend. I know I sound crazy for this. I will defend the costume. I hot take. All right. The Green Lantern movie costume is the best costume the characters ever had. I know, I know, it's a hot take, but I I dig it anyway. Uh, so yeah, we get we get this. Uh, series of, of movie prequels. These were a series of uh, issues that came out starring different members of the Green Lantern Corps, um, and they're basically large error characters, larger supporting characters in the film itself. Um, and these are just one-shot stories with them that all tie into the plot of the movie in some way, shape, or form. Um, that being said, not really, not not significantly. Uh, the none of these plot plots really depend on the movie, and ultimately they probably most of them probably just work as regular Green Lantern stories. So um, yeah, if you're worried that oh I hate the movie, if you don't absolutely despise the costume and character designs, uh, I think I think you'll be fine. Um, anyway. So, the first one we get is a story about Abin Sir. Uh, he is stopping a smuggler uh, who ditches his payload uh, in an asteroid field, and it ends up crash landing on Earth. Um, and then Abin has to go and retrieve it without alerting interstellar contact. Unfortunately, it just happens to crash land near a military base where Lieutenant Amanda Waller uh, is the only one to see it whilst on guard duty. So she goes to check it out, and it landed by happenstance in the middle of a field of military vehicles that have been left to rust and decay. But because it's alien technology... It kind of merges all these military vehicles into this giant kill machine thing that Amanda Waller tries to fight on her own. Um, it doesn't quite work, uh, and Abin Sir has to come in and, and try to save the day, but he actually does admire Amanda Waller as he sees her trying very hard to, to stop the machine. Um, which she, she actually does end up succeeding at, surprisingly. So Abin Sir doesn't really do much in this story, except for kind of gaslight Amanda Waller. Uh, realizing what the machine is, he can't allow even a, a scrap of it to exist. And since it landed in a junkyard, he does the only safe thing he can think of and picks up the entire junkyard. Uh, leaving nothing on the... nothing of the, the scene. So he takes it and throws it into the sun. Uh, meanwhile, Amanda Waller gets a promotion because she's seen things but is smart enough to stay quiet about it. And that kind of sets up Abin Sir and Amanda Waller for our story. Abin um, thinking to himself, you know, maybe Earth is actually ready to, to join the intergalactic community. Nothing else it shows promise. And then it says epilogue years later and it's Abin, you know, hurling towards the nearest sentient planet. And it turns out that's Earth. It says Earth. Yes, a planet with promise. To be continued in Green Lantern movie. So, on some level, yeah, that, that works and it ties in with the movie and everything, but ultimately it, it, it works on its own just fine. That's just a fine Ab and Sir story that really doesn't have not, anything to do with the, the movie. Um, the Amanda Waller stuff's a little weird, but I, that's a fine Amanda Waller origin, too. Uh, the next story is with Tomar Ray. And I like that we get these close-ups of the, uh, the movie design characters. Uh, I got a um, I got a book to show off here a little bit later to further justify my love for the Green Lantern movie um, character designs and, and costume design stuff. So I'll go through some of that art too in a sec. But yeah, um, there's there's really close-up on Tomar Rain. It looks good. 
Hashtag fight me. Uh, all right, so Tomar Ray is floating around on Oa and is given word of a mission to go stop a deadly terrorist wanted by the Guardians. And so he starts following him, and the guy, the evil terrorist, heads off into the uh, Forbidden Sector. I do love the the way the artists here. Um, not all of the art in this book is is done by one guy. Um, so let's see here. The first story with Abin Sir has eh, it's not bad, but it's it's clearly not in the artist's comfort zone. I don't think this art. I think this artist just looks like they do more of a um, minimalist, more cartoony kind of style. Whereas this image of Tomar Ray, I think, just looks a lot better. I think just fits the artist's style a little bit more. Able to work with that level of detail. Um, so Tom Ray is, is hunting this uh, terrorist who um, has laying waste to a planet and uh, heads off into space to find him. Uh, apparently when Tomar's people get angry, their skin turns a bright red. And that'll even show through the costume, which is kind of a cool idea. Neat little, little feature to show off there. That, since it didn't have the opportunity in the movie. Um, but yeah, the terrorists head off into the Forbidden Sector, and so Tomar Ray is not supposed to go in there. Uh, it's, it's against the law for Green Lanterns to go in there, but he decides it's more important to go stop the guy. Finds the ship, they get in a fight, and because of the area where they are, Tomar begins to feel fear, and his ring begins to quickly drain. So he is ultimately able to defeat the bad guy and, and you know, win the fight. But it leaves his ring so low that he doesn't really have, unfortunately, many options. So not only did the terrorist, in fact, steal a ship, he stole a ship with hostages on it. And so it leaves Tom Ray in a pretty shitty situation where he has to decide, all right, do I try to save one of the hostages? Do I leave all of them here on this planet and try to come back with help, knowing that this guy might kill all three of them before I get back? Or do I take him with me alone and leave the hostages here? Hopefully, I'll be able to be back in time for a rescue mission. And so he makes a choice that he's not happy with and takes the bad guy, leaving the three guys, and that's where our prequel, or our, uh, a prologue for the Green Lantern movie starts, with those those three guys accidentally discovering Parallax. Again, something that does tie into the movie, but it just works really well as a story on its own, so I appreciate that. Next we get a Kilowog story, and again, nice, nice close-up render on the artwork for the movie, so that's really cool. Explosions. Uh, this artist does a pretty decent job um, dealing with the, um, the the movie costume and, and that level of detail. Let's see here. Patrick Gleason and Tony Shanstein were the, the pencilers on here. and they I know Patrick Gleason did a lot of the Green Lantern stuff. Um, Cliff Richards was the artist on the Tomar Ray thing. We got Carlos Ferreira, Ferreira doing the art here, um, and I think he does kind of a middle ground. His his stuff is it's definitely capable of showing off the level of detail in the movie, but it's I don't know if he really makes it work. I don't know if he makes it look as good as I feel the Tomar Ray one did. So take that how you will. Um. Anyway, so it's Kilowog training some new recruits. Uh, Salak shows up and yada yada. Um, meanwhile, a lantern who has precognitive abilities goes to tell the guardians that she see she senses something really bad coming, and that's parallax in the movie. Um, and so they're not really sure what to make of it. Meanwhile, Kilwag's training everybody. Um, and one of his exercises is to wake them up in the middle of the night, tell them their planet that O is under attack by the Spider Guild, and that they all have to work together to try to stop it. But they're quickly, quickly defeated. All the rookies are doing a terrible job and are unable to save the day. The Spider Guild are getting, um, begin to drag people away when Kilwag says, Alright, end simulation. 
and tells them that this was all just a giant uh, ruse to to make them feel what it's like to be under this intense level of pressure. Um, eh, hey, hey, buzzed. Buzzed is there. Buzzed is there. Yay. Um, and so he forces them all to, uh, you know, repeat the exercise over and over again. There is one moment in here that I actually really, really liked. I thought it was really cool. Um, so this was all a lie? No, it was a wake-up call, you poozer. Next time it's going to be for real, and your fellow recruit play pals are going to be splattered all over you, or you're going to be splattered on them. Instead of the Spider Guild killing ten of you, they end up killing the entire class and taking over all of Oa because you didn't follow a direct order to destroy the Hive ships. You take away the caps of the battery symbol and it reminds you of what you're fighting for. It's your world on your chest. Your world is your badge. I really like that. So they, they take away the caps and it's just a circle. So that's the world. Um... But it's also her world and his. The simple circle of the planet is represented on your uniform and ring. You're not only safeguarding your world, you're safeguarding your neighbors. I like that a lot. That was a really cool little moment. I thought that was a, a neat little idea there uh, to, to visually represent it that way. That's pretty cool. Uh, anyway, Kellogg's called away on a... Called away by Tomar Ray, who gives him the sad news that Abinsur has passed on, and that it looks like an Earthman is going to be the one with his ring, and so they'll have to train him really, really well. Nice close-up of Ryan Reynolds' as Hal Jordan costume. This was this was pretty much the the shot that a lot of people really began to kind of warm up to the costume on until the movie came out, and then they just shed all over it all over again. Um, man, I really like, I love the way that the flowing energy would like carry down the, the lines on the costume and go to the ring whenever you made something. I thought that looked so cool in the movie. Uh, so the next chapter is called Being Human. This is actually written by Jeff Johns with Greg Berlanti. Um, the artist is Jerry Ordway. Uh, and this is... It starts with some of the events from the movie, and it shows Hal being transported to Oa and being examined there. And we get kind of an interesting take here, where Tomar Ray and Sinestro are looking over Hal Jordan and trying to figure out why the ring would choose him, choose a human, since they are so backwards, and they're, they're all surprised by this. <laughs> And so they begin to use what the ring is scanned to look at Hal Jordan's memories. Um, and so we get some, some neat little stuff here that I thought was pretty cool, uh, including a reference to something that happened in the comics, which is Hal Jordan getting kicked out of the Air Force for punching a superior officer. Um, and I don't know, I like that quite a bit, honestly. Um, but all Sinestro sees is how Hal Jordan is... This human flies with rudimentary machines only to evacuate when it becomes dangerous. He joins what passes as their military forces only to lash out against his superiors. He walks away from those that would fight for him. This Earthman is reckless, insubordinate, and most of all, afraid. And then Tomar Ray is able to look at the same events and go, Ring, go back, and sees that like the reason he punched out a superior officer is because the guy was like, you know, harassing a woman. Um, Yes, you see, Sinestro, nothing is as simple as it seems. Do you have anything to say for yourself? I quit. A very hot curtain moment. Um, is this supposed to impress me, Tomar Ray? This pathetic conflict, a conflict this human started to protect someone from another. The fact that it was his superior officer is immaterial. As is this act of heroism, it simply shows he quits when things become difficult, but the scope of our responsibilities is beyond a human's comprehension, Tomar Ray, and more important, it is beyond their ability. These humans are born on Earth and they die on Earth. They have experienced nothing outside of their own incestuous universe. Um, again, these things are not often what they appear, Sinestria. Humanity has achieved a great many things. <laughs> and it shows like Gandhi and MLK and shit. What's that? It's just a 
It's the assembly line? That's weird. Um, perhaps there may have been humans in the past that achieved great things relative to their world, but what of now? Ring, show us if there was any other candidates on the planet Earth worthy of being selected for the Green Lantern Corps. And it just shows a locker room where there's Guy Gardner and maybe Hal Jordan, or not Hal Jordan, maybe John Stewart. Um, one other? Give it time to complete scanning, Sinestro. There could be others. No, as I said, Tomar Ray, this is all a mistake. How many from your world of Kurogar could wield that ring and do what you do, Sinestro? None. Then your world, my world is united. One language, one culture, one people. I have taught them to be without fear. Something humans are apparently incapable of being. So let's see where this human's fear was born. And I see like Hal Jordan's dad dying and stuff. And I just, I tend to like this story a lot because it's just, again, it's, it's fairly disconnected from the movie. This is probably the one that has the most connection, but it, it works pretty basically because of how close the movie ended up following the comics. Um, so yeah, we get like, we see Hal Jordan watching his dad die and yada yada. Um, and then it's like, Hal Jordan is full of fear and if we are to defeat fear, we must be impervious to it. If we are not, what hope do we have to defeat Parallax? Yes, what hope indeed. Um, and that's when the costume begins to form on Hal Jordan. So it's like right before the the scene of Hal meeting Tomar Ray. I quite like that. I thought that was a, again, it was a pretty good moment. Um, and then we just get some other like cool scenes. Uh, and these are just completely disconnected from the movie almost. It's, it's actually really impressive that they just didn't give that much of a fuck. Um, you get some scenes of like this alien who wants to uh, create things in a land torn up by war um, when she becomes the Green Lantern of her sector. And she goes to Oa and begins to learn and she's like, no, I'm, I cannot be a warrior. I'm, th that is not me. I am, I am a creator. I, I do not fight. And they're like, oh, well, you must go seek the Emerald Warrior then. So she learns to use the ring to fly, to go seek out the Emerald Warrior. Um, and along the way she accidentally crashes into a ship and causes it to start to collapse, but she ends up saving it by creating a giant green flower to catch it and safely deliver it to the ground. Then she realizes, then they go, oh good, so you have found the green warrior then. You have found the great emerald warrior. It's like, wait, I have? Yes, it is you. I, I quite like that. That's just another, it's a solid, that's, that's just how you do a random green lantern story. Image of Sinestro, nice up and close. Looks good, looks good. Um, we get The Chosen One. This is by Jeff Johns and Michael Goldenberg, uh, with art by Harvey Tolboy, Cliff Richards, and Jerry Ordway. Um, we get buzzed again, but the artist... The artist draws him way too big, and I don't like it. Buzzed, he, he can... He doesn't have to be like a housefly like this big. But the second you make him, like, human-sized bee, mm, no, it, it suddenly got very, very frightening. <laughs> um, it goes from being like, oh, have fun and cute. He can be like, he can be like a, you know, the size of your fist or something. Just small enough where it's like, whoa, but, but they're just big enough where it's like, whoa, but still small enough where it's not, like, terrifying. <laughs> so this story... Oh man, what even happens? Oh, this is when all the Green Lanterns find out about Adam Sir dying. And they look at uh, the the ceremony of his his tomb being created, and Sinestro reflects back on everything that Adam Sir did for him. So we get this origin for Sinestro where his world was in chaos and he tried to appeal both sides. Um, you know, the the ones in the high classes are just trying to divide us and so they can remain where they are but if we all just saw past that then we could be a greater people together and it's at that point that the ring chooses him and takes him to Oa and Abin Sir talks to him on Oa and like Sinestro is furious because he'd heard legends of the Green Lantern Corps but knew it couldn't be real because of all the chaos on his world if there was a Green Lantern then then they would have stopped it um, and Abin Sur has tried to talk some sense into him. Um, 
and so Sinestra ends up going back and and helping um you know Amstra so Green Lanterns don't believe in vengeance we believe in justice and Sinestra is kind of left alone to reflect on that so that one again nothing nothing too great but I was I was reasonably impressed by it um and then the last story is just basically the the prologue of the movie the this essentially star wars scroll that just goes through the creation of the green lantern corn um we get some really cool art that shows all the the weird variety of characters um and with the the very intently designed uh 3d model based characters so i thought that was pretty cool i will say Kilowog probably doesn't look the best he could in that image um and also like this that's that's neat to see uh it reminds me of the um, the old Green Lantern Corps logo. Kind of wanna, I kind of wanna see if I can chop that and turn it into a banner because that's really neat. But yeah, that's just it's the prologue of the movie, more or less, just with different art. So that was cool. Um, and then we get a preview for New Fifty Two, Jeff John Sinestro. Um, yeah. So I actually really did enjoy this. Uh, it's it's very tangentially connected to the movie, so it is essentially just a Tales of the Green Lantern Court book. Uh, and I always really do enjoy those, with the exception of last week. Um, so I thought I thought that was really good. Uh, Shadow Batman says, I like how there is no scene where Sinestro has that moment of where, look, look audience, he's going to be evil on one day. Yeah, that's what I really like about Sinestro, is he's not technically evil and, and like the mustache twirling comic villain that a lot of people think of him as. He's, he's a sympathetic fascist, um, which I don't know if that's a thing that exists, but they, they do a good job of, of portraying him as a character where you can, if, if you grew up under those circumstances, you can see where it comes from, but he still goes too far anyway. He's still very clearly in the wrong, uh, and I, I really do like that. Otherwise, just wanted to show this off real quick, take the dust jacket off, get some cool cover art on the inside. This is just a, um, a book that came out as part of the promotional stuff, and it's just kind of, you know, the behind the scenes of the Green Lantern movie, uh, more or less. Um, so you just get all kinds of cool stuff in here, including some really great prints, <laughs> uh, that looks, uh, of some of the comic art, but that's cool. Um, otherwise, this is just all talking about some of the stuff that they did to, to work on getting the movie together, um, and I, I do quite like it. Uh, the thing I like most, though, is the character design, so I'm gonna find that section real quick. Um, because they just put a lot of work in these characters, and I wanted to show off some of the uh, really high-quality images you get of the 3D models because they look great. Um, and there's even some practical effects, like here's Avin Sur's dead body. I thought that was kind of cool. Because that scene was done practically. Um, oh, where's the character design at? There's the costume design. They go into all the detail of how they got up with that. And it's designed for Oa and what they went through with that. I mean, really, some of this design concept work is really, really sick. <laughs> I really do love a lot of the, the passion put into the visual side of the Green Lantern movie, and that's one of my favorite things about it. Um, ah, the Green Lantern core. So now we just get some really cool, nice up-close images. Like, here's a very good close-up on the model for Tomar Ray. And I just love the like translucency of the skin. It looks so weird and cool and detailed, and I think it's great. Um, and they they go through some of the stuff. Like in the in the comic, they mention that Tomar Ray's people get get angry and change their skin tone, and so that's reflected here. I thought that was pretty cool. And that was a detail that they wanted to put in the, the model for the character because they were planning to make more movies, but they just never got to, to really show off. Uh, nice close-up on Kilowog. You can even see, like, the little hairs coming up out of his skull and, and his face. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Sinestro is a character that they did a lot of different designs for the um, the costume. They, they weren't quite sure what they are going to do. Fantastic makeup work on Mark Strong as Sinestro there. Intense. 
Um, <laughs> and then you just get like other cool little close-ups on some of these weird alien designs. Uh, I really like it. I like it a lot, guys. Let's see if I can find some of the better ones. Oh, yep, there's Boudica. Nice close-up on her. Then we got Rotlop Fan, my boy. My boy, Rotlop Fan. Like these, uh, where's my hand up? Okay. Yeah, it's so hard to see These like big nodes on his back are apparently like his eardrums. Um, they, they really did a lot of detail in, um, in creating the, um, the thought process behind these characters. Left, final design for Rotlop Fan by Neville Page until he summers. The blind green lantern communicates acoustically, so the hunches on his back were designed as huge tympatic membranes. We made them into these large gelatinous sacs that create and resolve sound, explains Page. So that's really cool. <laughs> um, and we just get like all these, you know, really intense high detail renders on these different members of the Green Lantern Corps that they designed for the movie, and I always thought it was really neat. Um, like this design for Salat is just crazy. It's it's so cool and, and imaginative. <laughs> Opposite, final design for the multi-limb bookkeeper of the Green Lantern Corps, Salak, by Neville Page and Tully Summers. Left, final metafill, designed by Neville Page and Tully Summers. And what's cool about this is all of these are actual characters from the comics. You know, Rotlop fan, obviously. But, like, metafill is, like, a plant creature that's a Green Lantern. And so they had to, like, okay, how do we make that look, you know, realistic? Uh, and so that's really cool that they, they managed to do it. And so they designed all the characters essentially as, as nude, and then, you know, sculpted the costume onto it, which is really, really cool. Um, and yeah, then you just get these, these finalized uh, things that, that name every member of the core that appeared. Um, so, like, Ayalande is there. Um, Bizd. Bizd showed up. So happy about that. Uh, Gallius Zed, who in the comics is just a, like a head with two arms and two legs, but they actually had to try to find a way to make that believable and work, and they, I think they did a good job. Um, yeah, it's just a bunch of cool designs, stuff like that. Always, always appreciated that about this book. Um, there's more to it, but I, that's my favorite section, so I figured I'd show it off. Anyway, that's going to do it for me for Comic Reviews today, everyone. I hope you had a really good time watching. Um, until next time, bye!